cut out the shape of the pick guard now. You cut me It's all gone under my skinny hill Thought I'd point out just a couple of things while we're here. You notice I had this large piece of wood underneath this as I was cutting this out. And you might say, why did you have that piece of wood there? Well, that gives me a zero kerf, a zero hole. There's a large hole in this right here. So this, putting this on here, then the blade is cutting straight down through that slot and it has no tear out in the back that way. And this wood's very brittle and it could easily splinter off the back and chip and it could even potentially crack the wood. So by having a zero kerf here, that really does help a lot. And you know, I also came over to this bandsaw rather than my normal bandsaw because it has the tiny quarter inch blade and that will also do less damage to this brittle wood. So that's the reason I did what I did. The laser cutter, as you can see, is cutting out the pick guard uh, inlay area. We call that rastering the uh, area there. And the, it is amazingly accurate how, how uh, it cuts that out. And in fact, it's kind of a trial and error every time. Um, every piece of wood is a little different. Even though it's ebony, like this one has more light areas in it. So every time you do this, it's a little bit of a trial and error. I cut it out at a power rating of 14.5 to begin with, and I could tell that the raster uh, area was not deep enough. So I'm recutting it at a power rating of 16.5, which doesn't mean much to anyone. It's just that it's as various power ratings that this laser has. And I'm hoping that this time it will be deep enough, although I won't know till it's finished. Well, that's the second pass after rastering it twice. I really was expecting a better result than that. That doesn't look very deep at all. So I started scraping it, and there's a lot of char built up, and I think that's part of the problem. I think. I think if I scrape all this char off, it may be deeper than I think it is. Although I'm not too sure about that either. Now I might save this char for using it as a blackening agent whenever I want to blacken like some uh, epoxy or something. Because this stuff is pretty fine and it's pretty black. not making me real happy because it doesn't seem to be very consistent. I don't remember having this specific problem the last time. Pretty much every time I use the laser cutter it seems to be a little bit of a trial and error thing and that's kind of sad because it's such a good tool but this wood is so inconsistent it's really hard to know what you're going to get each time. Well, it's not going to be real exciting watching me just chisel all that out so I'll show you what it looks like after I get it all cleaned out. Well I scraped all of the area out where the uh, rastering was done by the laser cutter. I'm not happy with the depth and it's not even consistent. It's deeper in places and not so deep in other places. So I have set up my little router base with about a 47 thousandth depth of cut. And I'm just going to go back over this manually and try to cut it out and make it more even. I think I can stay within the lines there that the laser cutter did and that should help me a lot. I've got my light down here shining at an angle. You're not going to be able to see what I'm doing at all. You know, at least I'll show you the process. And that's what I'll be doing a lot of, and you can see it fills it up with dust. So what I'm going to have to do is set up my air compressor and blow through here and blow the dust out of the way. And there's a little connection right here where I can hook up the air compressor to that. But I'm not going to show any more of this. I'll just show you what it looks like when I'm finished.
I'm over at the bandsaw. I've spent some time setting this all up. I've put in a uh, resaw blade. This is only a half inch resaw blade, but I think it'll get the job done. And I'm going to resaw this paduke for the back of the guitar. He knew me over again. He knew me. He knew that he had. How can I find words for that? Well, I kind of messed up on that sawing that last board. I for some reason had sides in my head and I made it only five inches wide. Now that's perfectly fine for that center strip. I always make a three piece back. And so that five inches wide will work perfect for the center strip. But now I'm gonna resaw these boards in full width for the two outside strips that go up the back. So I don't know what I was thinking before, but you know, it wasn't a major catastrophe because I'll be able to use that wood, you know, all of that wood. So it's not like a great loss. It's just that uh, I wasn't thinking correctly is all that it amounts to. And we're going to resaw this now in the full width. And these will be the two outside pieces for the back. He got me just like the north wind. Friends, I'm going to give you a chance here to weigh in in the comments, even though it's totally rhetorical, because by the time you see this, this decision will long have been made. But anyway, so there's several options I can see on lining this up. Now, this is the V that will go down the middle of the back. You know, and I make three-piece backs to be perfectly truthful, mainly because I don't have large enough boards to make a two-piece back and that's the bottom line truth so three-piece makes more sense but I also just think they look nice and they look more decorative so I might just do a three-piece anyway even if I did have a large enough board okay so this grain here is pretty straight right down the middle pretty straight these grains have run out they both are running out this direction i don't know if you can see that in the video as well as i can see it here now this would be one way to line it up and that way the grain is running out to the center seam another way to line it up would be like this and now the grain is pretty much paralleling the center seam and that's not too bad i like either of those options actually about equally well and yet a third option would be to do it kind of like this and you know underlay this so that it is going almost exactly perfectly with the grain you know and that way there's almost no run out at all now I don't like this option too much just because it makes it look like there's just one continuous wide board I'm not a fan of that one too much but it is a possibility so I like this one where it's running into the center, I think I like it the best, just because it shows a, a variance of the grain more than even this one, which is just pretty much paralleling the grain. But this is nice too. Now keep in mind there's gonna be a decorative strip down the middle, down, down each seam. There'll be a little strip right, right through here. So actually it's gonna look closer to that with the crack in there than it will right together. So with, with the crack in there, parallel, this is more or less pretty parallel. It looks okay. Let me see with the crack in there, with the run out heading toward it. I think that's my preference. It just looks a little bit more, like there's a little more going on. I think that's the way I'm gonna do it. So your rhetorical comment is just rhetorical. 
<laughs> anyway, I just thought you'd like to see there is options there. Well, my friends, I spent a good amount of time off camera straightening these t these cuts. And my viewer friend Chuck, who used to be a doctor, I believe, a retired doctor, sent me, I think it was him that sent me these planes. Now, I could be wrong, I, but I believe it was him. I should keep names on all this stuff, but to be honest, I can't keep track of what I'm doing, let alone all this other stuff. Anyway, I took the blade out of this, went over to my grinder, did my sharpening trick with the hollow grind, and then I sharpened it up and honed it on this leather and I got it so razor sharp is unbelievable. It just shaved hair. Didn't even have to touch the hair. The hairs were just jumping off. So after I got it that sharp, I then planed the high spots. I put each edge against my straight edge and held them up to the window here behind the camera and I could see through it really good. Any place there was a high spot, I hit it with this. Then I went, took it over to really fine tune it with some sandpaper on my uh, jointer table. And I believe I've got it just as tight as you could ever get it. I have marks across it in places so that you can't mix them up and switch them around. That way I know they go together just like that. So I guess the next thing is I need to plane these to thickness because they're still thick. There's no way to plane it very well or sand it very well once I get them glued together. My commercial sander, I don't have enough faith in it to do it, even though it would do it. I truly don't think it's that accurate. Not enough to suit me for the, the thickness that I want on this guitar. So I'm going to plane it on my little homemade thickness sander ahead of time because each board will fit through there. And once I get it down to the proper thickness, then we'll put that centerpiece in and push this all together. At least that's my plan. I'm not even going to film that because you saw me uh, thicknessing the top, I believe, on the thickness sander. And it's exactly the same process. So I'm just going to run these through there until I'm happy with the thickness. Now friends, I'm prepping for the back joint on this guitar. And my purfling, or whatever you want to call this, that I made, just wasn't quite long enough. You know, it was the first time I ever made it, and it just didn't work out that way where it was long enough. So I'd taken pieces and cut them apart and put them back together, as you can see here. And you really can't tell it. I stagger these joints so that they are not straight across. And then that way, everything is staggered. You don't notice it. So I'm going to get the tight bond out and put tight bond on all the joints here. And on camera every time I think the uh, glue will always refuse to come out. I think that's just what glue does. That should be good and I'll just take that and work it around a little bit. And then I'll make sure I got good glue on this too. I'll devise a little clamping system for that and wipe off the uh, squeeze out, etc. And we should be good to go. I'm ready to glue up the back. I, uh, this has got to be a very quick operation. So I have this board clamped to my saw table. I have this board clamped to my saw table and basically the back is a wedge so if you push them that direction they get tighter and tighter. So that's how I'm going to clamp it. It's just by pushing them forwards they will clamp themselves. But before I get that far I have to get glue on all these surfaces and there's more surface than, than there appears to be. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight surfaces that have to be glued. Uh, it's just amazing on a three-piece back, but that's what has to be done because of these extra strips. So I'm going to get after it.
that set oh several hours minimum you know probably at least half the day six maybe five six hours before I take that apart maybe longer well you can see the result of the glue up on the guitar back it's just as flat as a pancake which I'm really happy with I always like to have them come out real good and flat now I've got to cut this purfling strips down that I made. I've got to cut them down to the thickness of the top. It may have been better had I just ran through my thickness sander ahead of time, but the problem is you never know if it's going to line up perfectly or not. And so this way I can cut it down to the exact size and shape. Right now it's fairly proud, so I'm going to use this finger plane and just be real careful that I don't slide off on the back. I have to be very careful about that because it's easy to do. And once I get it real close, then I'll go to a scraper and scrape it smooth. But I'll be doing a whole lot of this. I just thought I'd show you the quick part of the procedure. And then I'm gonna just turn the camera off and get that part done. And when I go to the scraping, I'll show you what that looks like. Well, my friends, I've got that fairly leveled off. I haven't scraped it yet. You know, you can still feel it right now. I've got it really close with the finger plane, but it's, it's still not perfect. But I was just tapping on this, and I thought, you ought to hear this. I wish you could hear it here live in person, because it really does have almost a metallic sound. It's, it's almost like you pick up a sheet of steel or something, and you tap on it, and you hear like a, a ring. It's kind of like that, except maybe a little richer ring. I don't know if it'll come across again, but try to listen. Long sustain. That long. crazy. If you could put it right next to your ear, you would not believe the sound that's coming out of that. And that's what's cool. That's why I always say, you know, you can't just use any kind of wood you want for, to make an acoustic guitar. Now, you can, but you won't get the same kind of results as if you pick high quality soundboard type wood. Uh, now, granted, this is the back. You know, the top is the most important by far. It's you know, when you're comparing the top to the back, it's the 80-20 rule. The top is 80% more important than the back. But when you're comparing everything, you know, like this compared to, say, maple, this would be 80-20. This has 80% more sound than maple's going to have for, like, the back. So it's really important to select very high-quality wood, and you won't find anything better than this right here, I can tell you. It's awesome. Now we're going to level it out just a little bit more. So... On this, you know, I can use a multitude of scrapers. So I take a scraper like this. I can scrape it like so. I've got this scraper really sharp. And this will scrape, it'll scrape everything. It'll scrape the uh, paduk and it'll scrape the actual inlay strip as well and get them perfectly level. It doesn't need very much, but this actually just curls the wood right off of there and does a really nice job. Almost as good as sandpaper. People that are really good with a scraper will argue that it's better than sandpaper. I would say I'm in that 80-20 rule thing. I, I'm about 80% good with this. That last 20% I generally get with sandpaper though. That's pretty darn nice. Now we'll go with this. Doesn't take long to get it down there when you got a good sharp scraper.
for those of you who are not familiar, the way I do it is I, I put this finger or maybe even two fingers on the top and then I can kind of control the height of the scraper by that. That way I'm not digging in really a whole lot with the scraper. I can control my depth. That's pretty nice. Probably still hit it with a little sandpaper though. Now on the other side, even though it's, it's real flat, but there was some glue squeeze out. So I'm just gonna use the scraper to try to clean that up a little bit. Now keep in mind on the other side here, unless this cleans up even better, I will probably just put strips down through here as reinforcement anyway on the inside of the guitar. I mean, more than likely this is gonna go on the inside is what I'm saying. It could possibly end up being the outside if it cleans up really nice. It just depends on what I think looks the best when I'm done. The Paduk really does change colors a lot and the glue caused it to stain kind of a darker color, almost black, maybe it's purple. I'm not sure what color it is, but it's dark anyway. That's looking good. Clean this one up a little bit and then I'll hit them both with some sandpaper and try to clean it up a little bit more. And then we're gonna cut the profile of the back out. That feels really nice. I'm gonna go ahead and go to the sandpaper after I clean up this mess. I've got the pattern laid on the guitar and the want to mention again that this pattern came off of a D28 that was owned by Gene and Walt Henry and the guitar actually belonged to their son who was killed at a young age in a car wreck. So this pattern is very sentimental to me. Gene and Walt are both deceased as well at this point. Wonderful people. Gene was a wonderful piano player and Walt was a World War II hero. He was on, I believe it was the Oklahoma, although recently I heard it was the Arizona. But anyway, he was on one of those ships at Pearl Harbor when it was actually attacked and he wound up in the water. And some of the uh, local people there actually rescued him in a, uh, like a rowboat type deal, pulled him from the water. So he was just a, an American hero. That was Walt Henry. He was 90 some years old, about 94 or five years old, I recall, and he was out there uh, splitting his own firewood, <laughs> getting ready for the winter. He, he was quite a man. I'm tracing this with the uh, Sharpie, and that gives me a wider line, and I can cut outside that line and that just gives me a little bit more room to manipulate things as I'm building the instrument. So there you go. We're about ready to cut that out now. We're going to cut out the profile, so here we go. When he left me with nowhere to begin See, it turned out real nice. It's going to be a beautiful guitar. Well, now we've got the sanding block out and we're going to attempt to get all the little details sanded out of this uh, back here where, the, uh, where you can't even feel this transition. That's what my goal is. Well, there's gonna be a whole lot more of that sanding to do, and there's no point in eating up camera footage on that. So we'll show you what it looks like when we move on to the next step. My friends, this portion of the video is sponsored by 
vacuum pressing systems out of Brunswick, Maine. They have provided me with a vacuum system so that I can glue up things like these necks on these guitars and I'll turn the camera down here and show you what I'm doing. As you can see, I'm putting glue on these parts and this is the hardest part of the whole process is getting glue because I have a bunch of plies of wood. So basically I'm making a plywood neck and I'm using mahogany as the base main part. Then I'm using a uh, ply of curly maple and then uh, I'm going to have a ply of walnut and then another curly maple and then another outside of the mahogany. This is always a tedious pain in the neck job mostly because of the clamping process because everything just moves on you but with the vacuum pressing system that we have it is so much less uh, problematic. It just squeezes it together, sucks all the air out, and it just clamps it up like a dream. There is no need to be gluing up l laminations like this with clamps and all the problems you get into with everything moving and sliding and it's just always a pain. It really truly is. But uh, having this system to do it just changed everything. If you do a lot of uh, laminate type gluing or you know different plies of wood anything especially anything flat like this I certainly recommend that you check out vacuum pressing systems um, vacuum systems they have different sizes they sent me one of the smaller sizes which is all I really need because I'm working on instruments all the time and even this small one will do quite large projects. I, I'll have to look and see and maybe we'll have Melissa put it on the screen on how large of uh, a project we can do with the bag they sent me. It's a pretty large bag as you can see and uh, I haven't measured it lately but I'm going to say it's roughly oh roughly two foot by three foot uh, maybe even a little bigger than that. In addition I have little pieces of like this walnut, I didn't have a piece large enough, so I'm having to glue in an extra little piece in here. Now keep in mind this is all sandwiched together, so you'll never see it anyway. That's perfectly fine with me. The laminations in the neck really do stiffen up the neck a lot and make the neck that much stronger and less likely to bend. And that's why I do it this way. In addition, it's just pretty. It, it makes it kind of a decoration. And so it looks nice, especially when you alternate the colors of the wood. So it's, it's nice that way too. And I put it on every single surface. I could probably just put it on one surface, turn it over, you know, put it on the other surface type of thing. I could do it that way, but I like putting it on this surface, that surface, then mating up. You get more squeeze out uh, and all that, but I also know that you get 100% glue coverage that way, which is what I'm after, is the glue coverage. Okay, two more, two more surfaces to cover, and then we're ready to slide it into the vacuum system. Okay, so that concludes all the glue spreading. And then I just try to line it up as best I can. Once I get it lined up, then I'm going to put it inside this bag. And slide it in here. And it's already moving on me. <laughs> it, this is always the tough part. I could maybe tape it up or something. I don't know. There's different ways to do it. In fact, I might just do that. I made myself a call to lay over the top of it, and I uh, made all the edges round and even the corners round, because that way it'll less stress on the bag. Because the parts that I've got in here are actually pretty square. I 
I think I will just take a second and tape this up and I'll be back with you just in a few seconds. You can see I just taped the parts together like that. That made it just a little bit easier. Put the camera back a little bit so you could see that each end of the bag has a snap. I've slid this piece of plastic through here and I've snapped it into this and then we just slide this. This is just a hollow piece of plastic that we slide over that and that seals the bag. So let me get that slid on. Takes a little bit of force to squeeze that on there, especially the first when this thing is new like this. This is uh, only a, about the third time I've used it and it's really a tight piece of plastic so it, it does a good job of securing the uh, plastic here and making sure that the bag is airtight. Now I have a vacuum hose under here and it comes up inside and it goes into my little form that I have and my little form has lines down through it where air can travel so it's made perfectly to suck all the air out and around this thing. So it's sitting on that little form that has root slots cut in it so that it will suck all of the air out of this bag really well. Now I'm going to turn on their system here and I just flip the switch and I'm going to turn it on auto uh, cycling. So it's going to suck all the air out of this thing here just in a few seconds. It takes it, a, it'll probably take it a minute. I'm just looking to make sure it's all lined up real good. I can see the air starting to draw out a little bit. Having the tape on there does seem to help hold all those different plies a little bit better. Now it's really starting to suck down and you can start to hear it labor a little bit. But it's just about got all the air sucked out of there now. And now it's impossible to move this. It's sucking it down to a, a, a negative 25 is about where it's at right now. I think it'll go somewhere about 26 or 7. I think I might actually open it back up. It seems like it slid just a tiny bit right here, and I'd like to straighten that up. So I think I'm just going to go ahead and turn it off, and then I'm going to let the air out of this for a second where I can move it again. I think I can move it again now. It was almost perfect. I just... You know, I probably should have given myself a little bit more tolerance on these things instead of making it so tight. That's probably what I should have done. Wood is expensive and, you know, I have small pieces of it, so I, I always try to get every little piece I can out of it. That looks good. I'll try it again. This time I'll try to hold it a little bit better. Yeah, that looks better this time. I think that's gonna work. We'll just let that set up. I mean, seriously, once that thing gets its grip on there, you cannot move it. There's a little different view of it. You can see the vacuum over here, and it's down to about 25 again, negative 25. It will kick off, and then it, as it needs to, to keep the, the uh, suction, it will kick back on automatically. It's about to kick off, I think I can tell by the sound. And that sure beats the heck out of putting all those clamps on there, trying to line this thing up. It's so much easier to line up this way. And it puts a ton of pressure on this thing. I'm amazed as hard as it's sucking that it doesn't suck the plastic hose shut. Well, it's running longer this time. I'm not exactly sure why. I would think that the seal is perfectly good. But it's tight. You can tell that. I do have it on auto, on auto so it should kick off, I would think. There may 
be a slight leak somewhere that I'm not aware of, but I don't know where it would be because everything sure seems tight. There it kicked off finally. Oop, kicked back on. I can tell just by the sound of it, it's right on the edge of kicking off. It just, it's holding a lot of pressure there. Trust me, that's really together tightly. Well, we'll show you what it looks like when we take it out of the mold later. This has been in here probably five to six hours now, so I'm gonna go ahead and take it out of here. I would imagine you'll hear this kick on in a second. There it goes. So it's been kicking on and off for you know five or six hours, keeping it very tight. I think it's long enough, and you know I'm gonna go ahead and turn this off and open up the bag and see what happened. I think I can just take it loose back here maybe. Yeah, that works. That's the easy way to do it. Just take it loose back there at the back of the machine. That already loosened up the bag. And now I will open it up. I kind of think that in one way this makes it dry faster and in another way because it's totally sealed I think it takes longer to dry or cure whatever you want to use whichever word you like because see you can still see there's wet glue in there and there's wet glue here but I think it's plenty dry so we're gonna go ahead and take it out of here and let it set overnight and then tomorrow we'll get started making the actual neck once again, thank you to Vacuum Pressing Systems out of Brunswick, Maine for giving me this. That is an awesome tool. It really is very helpful. Got my neck blank all ready to go here. It's been 24 hours as it was continuing to dry. It all feels real good and solid. Now I'm going to flatten off this top part, which will be the fretboard surface. And I'm going to do that on the joiner here. Now that I've got my fretboard surface flattened out and trued up, I can use that as my reference point for tracing the pattern of the neck. And mostly I just use this pattern to mark the corners and then I use the straight edge to draw the rest of it. So now we should be able to cut out that profile over on the bandsaw. As you may have been able to tell from that, there's quite a bit more work in gluing all of this up and getting it ready than there is in just cutting out that profile. Cutting out the profile just takes a matter of a couple of minutes. It's going to be a really nice neck. Uh, everything went perfectly on it. So now we need to cut out the top profile for the uh, fretboard area. And uh, that's not much cutting. Most of this is going to stay back here. There'll be a little bit cut out up here and a slight angle. So we'll mark that all up and get that ready to go. Before I cut out the rest of the profile on this neck, I decided to go ahead and true it up a little bit. So I flattened this off on the belt sander and got it good and square across here. Now I'm going to flatten this back side and I'll do that on my thickness sander, my homemade thickness sander. Before I cut out this profile, and maybe you can see that I've penciled it in there, where I'm going to cut all that out. Before I do that, I've decided I'm going to glue these wings on too. So I've made the wings that I can widen the peg head with a little bit. So I'll get those glued on 
and then I'll mark the profile up here and we'll cut out all of the profile at once. Before I cut the profile out of this uh, neck, I realized I had forgotten to cut these truss rod slot in here. So what I did was, because I've already glued these wings on, I just glued an, a parallel piece of the wing back here and I spent a lot of time with calipers, etc., making sure that they were going to be dead center of the neck. You know, like if you measure from here to the center or from here to the center, it's the same, same way here and here. I had to put little three pieces of tape on here just to make the difference up. Actually, two pieces of tape, I think. Anyway, um, now it's, it should be really centered. I've got my depth set on my table saw to the depth I want and I'm ready to run this through one way and then I'll turn it around and run it through the other way and that keeps the blade centered directly in the middle. We're now going to try to profile this neck. So here we go. I'm going to route the dovetail on the end of this guitar deck before I go any further. I've got the router set up with a dovetailing bit on here and I'm going to do it freehand. I've done it that way a few times in the past and it seems to work easy and fast for me so that's the way I'm going to do it. Your results might vary. number one I got a little bit whoopty there but not too bad not really through the whole pencil line so you know I try to stay proud of the pencil line that one there went almost through the pencil line right there but otherwise it's pretty straight and I'll straighten that up with a chisel later and I'm gonna do this side now at the same depth the depth is not deep enough obviously so I don't try to cut it all in one pass I always try to uh, do it in two or three four passes well, actually, two passes, uh, you know, two per side, so about four passes total. Here we go with the other side. All right, so now I'm going to drop it down to the full depth and cut it again. Okay, we're at the bandsaw, and we're going to rough cut some of the extra wood away from this neck. And we're just going to take our time and go nice and slow so that we don't make any mistakes. The key thing that you want to watch when you're doing this is that you don't let the blade get into this edge because this edge is already at the final dimension. So you want to keep the blade quite a ways from these two edges right here. As long as you do that, you should be okay. are just roughed out you know I'm sure I could cut more away from that but then again you're just taking a risk and there's no reason to take that risk because there's other ways you can cut this very very easily plus this being mahogany it's fairly soft anyway so just using rasps you can carve this down in no time with just a rasp I'm going to start the carving with just a big heavy rasp and this is a pretty rough rasp if the camera will focus there it goes so it's pretty rough and you know it's pretty aggressive but it doesn't take long to get rid of a lot of wood with this for the most part I use the round side of the rasp you can turn the flat side over on these longer spots doesn't take long that's already getting close to where you want it now I think what I'm going to try doing on this part up here is I'm going to try using the uh, 
rasp on the angle grinder and doing that a little bit in here just to knock off some extra because this is hard in grain and I think that'll knock it off real nice and easy and save a little elbow grease. So here's the rasp head on this angle grinder and these rasp heads are available uh, just like off eBay in different places. But they're really very aggressive. They will take off a lot of wood before you're ready. So you really want a light touch with it because you can sure ruin everything real quick with this. I can't recall the last time I tapped on this for you, but I was just tapping on it a moment ago here in the shop and it's so impressive that I, I'm going to tap it for you again. Hopefully this bell ring, I mean it sounds like a metallic bell, seriously. I can hear it that long. on where I tap on it you know you get a slightly different sound but pretty much it's for the most part it's one consistent ring it's really got the ring it's got to be one of the most resonant backs I've ever heard although this Paduke it never disappoints it's always very very good if the truth be told every time I build a back I kind of more or less guess at the radius based on plans and different things that I have. I decided to just make myself a radius jig and that's what I did. This is based on a 15 foot radius and it's you know nice and smooth. It's got a nice even arc to it. I can just center this on the brace now then you know more or less center it like that and then take the ends and just make sure they're equal, you know, amount of space, and then just draw the radius on it. And it just saves a lot of time and trouble. I don't know why I didn't do this years ago. But you live and you learn. You get smarter, hopefully, as you get older and you make things a little easier on yourself. fairly easy to line up really you can line it up by eyes is cl plenty close the trick is no one which thing has to be radius like these are flat braces that go toward the back and the radius goes this way in those <laughs> these are skinnier braces that go toward the front and the radius goes through the the uh, thicker part of these so you know it's just paying attention to what you're doing that's all so now I just got to go over to the sander and just knock off that radius on all these. It's very easy to do, really. I would already cut the radius on these two braces, and all I do is just follow the pencil mark along the sander like that. Very simple to do, especially on these flat ones. On this one, because it's going to be standing on edge, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. Not crazy more difficult, but a little bit more difficult because it's going to be standing on the thin edge and I'm cutting the radius on the fat edge. So here we go. of this square on the back side really does help you know I thought of doing that before I started but then after I got into it I thought you know I really do need something to keep it more square especially on these you know on these skinny edges like that and that really works great not only that but it, it keeps your hand away and you can pre use it to press as well so that's a really good little trick right there I just got one more to do and it should be fairly simple now that I've learned that with the square. I'm going to clean off the sandpaper and then we'll get going. Well all the 
these years I've been grinding little things against this wheel just by holding it with my fingers. That has really proved to be one of the best things I've learned to do right there. I just taught myself that trick this morning and it just keeps it square and you can get in real close. Try that. You'll be surprised how well that works. Assuming the footage turned out, you saw how I carved the radius in these braces. Now the trick is getting them turned the proper way. Yes, I could use a go bar system on this if I had a radius, you know, panel to press against. This is a radius, so the go bar doesn't work that great. It would straighten the braces out. So anyway, point is, I'm going to use just regular traditional clamps for this. And before I do that, I've already got it marked where the braces go, so I'm just going to scratch it lightly with this toothed blade. And it's just light. It's just to rough it up a little bit. Not doing much scratching, actually. And I'll go ahead and scratch all those places, and then I'll show you the next step. Now that I've got all those spots toothed up just a little bit with that blade, I'm going to go ahead and, and just take a little bit of acetone on a cloth and wipe it right, right across the place where these are going. Just as you can see, it, it picks up a lot of stuff very quickly. Just, I'm just going to do a light wiping there. And hopefully I didn't wipe off all my pencil marks. And now I should be able to get the glue on these and get them clamped up. On these flat surfaces, these glue spreaders work pretty well. Most of the time I just prefer to use a paintbrush, but these spreaders work pretty well too, so I just use whatever's handy. And I'm not putting a very heavy coat on this. I just, you know, I, I don't want a ton of squeeze out. I just want it to make a good bond. And I'll try to start in the center and work back. The worst part of this is you really do want to have leather protecting the back. I'm not too worried about the braces because they're going to get carved. That first clamp is the tough one because it everything wants to move, but if you can get the first clamp down real solid, then everything else is fairly easy. This is the kind of thing you can't really get too many clamps on. Well, as you can see, this is kind of fiddly with all these clamps, but uh, I'll get it done and show you what it looks like after I get it all clamped up rather than spending so much time with the video. I think you'll enjoy seeing how many clamps it takes to do this well. I thought I would have enough clamps to go ahead and clamp up all four of these, but apparently I don't, or at least not enough of these deep reach type clamps. Seems like I've done all of them before in the past, but Nevertheless, it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to do it this time, so I'm going to uh, let that set for a while, just as you see it there. You can see there's a lot of clamps on that. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine clamps just on that one brace. And let's see, do we have that many on the other one? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight on the shorter brace. So that's a lot of clamps. I gotta go run some errands in town and I may just go ahead and buy me some more deep throated clamps so that we have plenty of them on hand. I'd like to tell you that that was an easy clamp job. I really would like to tell you that, but it wasn't. It was just, I don't know why, it was just difficult to get it to, you know, get all the, you know, like just turning these things, they're all getting each other's way. I mean, there's just all kinds of little problems and issues. But the good news is it's all clamped up nice and snug and tight and everything's happy. These other back braces back here that you really can't see on camera, but these back braces, those set for about five hours clamped up. So I just recently took these, just minutes ago, took the clamps off. 
anyway, clamped it up here. This is going to set overnight. It's like five in the evening now or after. And uh, so tomorrow morning we'll come in, take these clamps off, and then perhaps start carving the braces. All the braces have been sitting overnight. They're all glued in. They're all squared off. They're not carved yet. But I like to tap on this thing to hear what the difference is in the sound. Oh my goodness, it's like an amplifier now. Listen to it now. It, it really sounds metallic. So now I can hear it a really long time. I'll, I'll tap and let you know how long I can hear it. About that long. About that long. It's really vibrating really well. And uh, it's gonna get even a little better once we carve some of the bulk off of those braces. We're about ready to start that process, so here we go. So I got my trusty little finger plane. And for the most part, especially these two back braces, you just kind of dome them over. You want them to stay strong, but you want to get rid of weight and bulk. know that I told you before but I just thought I will tell you that the um, grain lines are running this direction in this wood of course and they're perpendicular to the back in other words all of the grain lines in these pieces are up and down and maybe you can see that if you look at the very end of the brace there to see what I'm talking about so that's the way you want to put in braces they're much stronger that way you can carve them thinner that way. You would not want to put them in what I call slab sawn, where the grain is running like this and lay them up on your top. That has very little strength compared to this way. Well, this is going to take me a little while, and again, I'm not going to eat up a lot of footage with it. So you can see the process. You just keep carving until you're happy, basically, and I'll show you what it looks like when I'm happy. Well, my friends, I think I'm through carving this. You can see the braces have been shortened a little bit so that there's room for the kerf to go around this. I do not use the theory of running the braces all the way through the kerf. I don't do it that way. I have my braces stop at the kerf, and there's two or three reasons I do it that way. People will disagree, and that's okay. My belief is, first of all, it's just easier. Easy is always good to me. So in other words, you know, if you just shorten them like that, then you don't have to cut out notches in your kerf and all that kind of thing. That's reason number one, so it's just easier. Reason number two is I think you get a better joint because you're not having to notch it all out, so you get a more smooth attachment point all the way around. That's reason number two, which is minor, I'll admit. And reason number three is the important one in my opinion. And that is, these braces are shorter, they're a little lighter, they're probably a little thinner, and this keeps the braces away from the sides and lets the braces then have the freedom to vibrate with the top and move. If these braces are on the sides, then they don't get to vibrate as much. The sides are holding them still, you know. In my, this is my theory. I can't prove it. It's just a common sense theory. In other words, now these braces are not supported by the sides, and some people say that's why you want to do it. You want the back supported. I feel they're plenty strong, and I feel the connection all the way around here with the kerf makes it plenty strong, and this allows it yet to vibrate better. That's my theory. I'm sticking to it. I have no way to really prove any of that. It just seems to make good common sense to me. And, you know, about the strength thing, I've never had a problem. I've been building them for roughly 40 years. I haven't had any of them come apart, so, or, you know, have problems at, you know, like that. So, 
you know, I know 40 years isn't 100 years, but hey, it's a good start and I haven't had any problems. So, the sound of this is really nice. It's toned down now, it's come down in pitch. It's a deeper sound. It sounds a little more like uh, tapping on the side of a big metal drum or something. And it's a real long sustain, so like that long. About that long. So it's a, a real good long sustain. It's got a real good sound. Hopefully you can hear that. I'm real happy with that. It's good and stiff. One additional thing I did on this one that I have never really done this precisely. I do it every time. I just, this time I did it really precisely. And that is, I laid this on the braces and I carved the, the uh, braces to, on the inside to match this curve as well. So this, the whole guitar has this curve and these braces are also carved to that specific curve. <clears throat> so in effect, lightly, these braces are scalloped on the back as well as they will be on the top. Everything you can do to kind of lighten them up, yet keep them strong, is a good idea in my opinion. I feel like this back is incredibly strong. I don't think there's going to be any problem with it whatsoever, yet it still vibrates really well. I don't think there's any problem whatsoever right there. I'm looking forward to putting this on.